Nice to be here. How was the pizza? And now the problem is you're all going to fall asleep while I'm talking. So I'll tr I won't take it personally. So we're here to talk about work. But more specifically, we're here to talk about how to be good at your job. And even more specifically, we're here to talk about how to be a boss. And just so I know who I'm talking to, how many people in the audience are a boss? OK, that's a pretty good amount. Now notice I didn't clarify whether it means you're a boss at work, or you're just like a boss in your life, <laughs> or you're a musician, Rick Ross kind of boss. You know, We take all kinds of bosses. And the thing about being a boss is, be careful what you wish for, right? We all want to be a boss, but being a boss is really hard. Now, even if you're not a boss, I want you to know you're going to get a lot out of the talk today, because now you're going to learn about the secret language of bosshood. And what does a boss really mean when they say some of the things they, they say to you? That's what we're going to get into. So everyone's going to get something out of this. So let's take a look at. Uh, let me go to the next one. So today's agenda, we're going to do three things. We're going to talk about me for about five minutes, just to give you a little bit of context. We're going to talk about the books. I'm going to share an anecdotes, interesting things, stupid, simple ideas that you can apply tomorrow to whatever it is you do. And then the most exciting part, my favorite part, is talking about you. That's where we get to go into the Q&A. That's where you get to disagree with me. I get to say outrageous things. And then we argue back and forth in front of everyone. It's really, really fun. So I'll rush through everything just to get there, OK? So that's the agenda for today. So let me introduce myself. I've already told you my name is Justin. I graduated from Princeton University. I moved to San Francisco. I started working for The Gap. Then I started working for Old Navy. I was there for 11 years. I think by the end of it, I was running the Old Navy division. It was a billion dollar business. I was having a lot of fun. But who does anything for 11 years anymore? And so I started to get a little itchy and I thought, the world's changing. I want to do something else. And I, the world was going global, so I want to be global. So I jumped over to Levi's. Now we all know Levi's. And when I was there, I was in charge of every pair of women's jeans sold anywhere in the world. It was 10,000 points of distribution. And I just traveled the world trying to figure out how do we get more women into our jeans. And it was an incredible experience. I got to go to India. I spent two weeks in India. I spent time in China. I spent actually three months living in Tokyo. I was in Europe. I was all over the world. It was an incredible experience. And I'm not even sure what happened, but I walked into work one day. I walked into my boss's office. Her name was Lori. And I said, Lori, I quit. I said, I just can't do this anymore. I quit. And I walked outside, and I called my wife. And I said, uh, I just quit. <laughs> and she said, what? And I said, I just quit my job. And she said, OK, come home. <laughs> and so I went home. I had no plan. I had gone to work that day. I had never thought I was going to quit my job. I just quit my job. And just like I had wanted to go international and do these things with Levi's, what was bubbling under the surface was this idea of, in San Francisco, we're surrounded by people. Everyone's a part of a startup. And startup, every startup seems to work. And everyone gets really rich. And I was just like, I'm smart. Shouldn't I be doing that? <laughs> and so I started a little startup. It was called Black Sheep Postal Service. I always like to ask if anyone's heard of it. Usually, no one raises their hand, and then it's self-explanatory why it didn't last. <laughs> but it was an incredible experience. It was a, a life-defining defini moment for me, because up until that moment in my life, I had been surrounded by the infrastructure of family, schools, teams, and then big organizations that gave you goals, gave you support. You got to be in charge of people, all these things. And then all of a sudden, I'm by myself. It's just me. And not only do I have to do everything, but there's not that emotional network. There's not all these other things that are happening. And on top of that, this was one of the first times in my life where I just was a complete and utter failure. And that was really important because in order to be a good boss and to do these things, you have to have some of that human condition called empathy. And I hadn't had that before. And so I spent a lot of the time of those two years in the startup world, I'm not sure whether to call it crying on my couch 
or you know, complaining. I, I put it down to more of like a whimper, you know, just like curled up on the couch. And what happened is this company called me. They're called Uniqlo. How many people here know the brand Uniqlo? Okay, we're doing pretty good. We've got, we've got some stores here in the Bay Area. For anyone that doesn't know, it's the third largest apparel company in the world after Zara and H&M. And so they called me and I went running into the warm embrace of corporate America. <laughs> I, they gave me a big title, they gave me a big paycheck, they gave me a big team to manage, and it was just like, oh, where have you been the last two years? And so I've had a great adventure with them. I lived in London running their European business. I moved back to the US, ran their US business, and now I'm in charge of all their brand partnerships around the world. So that brings me up to today. So now you know a little bit about me. The only thing is, you really know nothing about me. And this is an important thing to point out, right? Because when we get into the working world, when we get into the working culture, so much of our interactions become transactional. Hey, where did you go to school? Hey, where did you used to work? Oh, that's a good place where you used to work. Oh, I've never heard of that place, so it can't be good. And it becomes this transactional relationship that doesn't allow you to really get to know who the person is. And this is really, I just want to plant this seed for some of the things we're going to talk about later today, which is, are you going, are you floating on the surface or are you getting down a little bit deeper to get to know who is the person that's sitting across from you? If you're a boss, who is each person on your team and what is important to them? If you're a coworker, do you really know what motivates a person? Do you know what's important to them? Do you know what's happening at their, in their house, in their home, in their childhood, whatever the case may be? All of those things are going to impact how they receive you and interact with you. So I just want to plant the seed about that. So let me tell you a little bit about a little bit more about me. I've written 14 books. I have 100,000 bees on my roof in San Francisco. It started with just one shoebox full of bees, and now there's 100,000, and I don't know what to do. <laughs> I also play the tambourine in a rock band, and I've toured around the country. It's kind of a weird thing, rock band, tambourine. And then the last thing I like to mention is I'm an efficiency monster. I've worked in corporate America for 17 years. I've never worked past 5 p.m. I've never checked an email on a weekend. I've never done any work. And the reason I mention that is it's important for you to understand what's important to me and also give you some credibility for some of the things I'm gonna talk about today between the two different books it's really about how do you make the most of your time. Now, the reason I'm an efficiency monster when it comes to work, it's because I've always struggled with, am I a sellout? Look at these companies I've worked at. I've worked at these huge, gigantic companies, and then secretly I wonder, am I an artist? And should I be doing that? And why am I working at these companies? And the devil's bargain that I struck was, I will work at these companies as long as I can get out of work at five o'clock, and then I never think about them ever again. And so that was like, that's how I made my life work. Now, whether that's good or bad, I'm not sure. I'm still figuring it out. But that's important to understand when you're looking at me, when you're thinking about me, when you're deciding whether you want to believe what I say or not. So that's, that's a little bit about me. And let me just point this out. Don't you know so much more about me versus one slide ago? And wouldn't every interaction that we have in the workplace be impacted by knowing these things about me? Wouldn't, it, wouldn't you decide which projects do I give Justin? How do I motivate Justin? You know, all those things would be influenced by getting to know a little bit more about me. So let me just plant that seed. All right, thank goodness we're done talking about me. So let's talk about my best-selling book, How to Write an Email. And the reason I say it's a best-selling book is because it's the only book I ever wrote where my mom wasn't the best customer. That's a big accomplishment, that's a big milestone. Remember I just was bragging about how I wrote 14 books and you guys are this guy is so ridiculous. And it's like, I just admitted to you, I've hardly sold any of them until I got to this one. And the truth is, that's because all the other ones I was pretending to be something I wasn't. And this book comes from a place of truth. I am really good at writing an email. <laughs> now, here's the thing about writing emails. This book isn't only about writing emails. It's about 
how to get started and how to get the basics right in your job. How do you write an email? How do you give a presentation? How do you work with other human beings? What do you do if someone at work hates you? How do you win an email fight? How do you get promoted? <laughs> Most people don't even know how to get promoted. I have a guaranteed fail safe for how to get promoted. I wanted to do money back guarantee. My wife who's sitting in the back wouldn't let me do that. But I promise you it works. And here's the thing. People don't work until 8 p.m. because they love what they do. People work till 8 p.m. because they suck at writing emails. <laughs> it's true, think about it. You send out an email and you spend two hours of your day waiting for someone to reply to that email. That's, add that up over a couple projects, that's why you're working until eight o'clock. The difference between you and me is I can write an email and I can write it in such a way with the subject and the body of that email that I get a reply in 10 minutes. And by the way, we'll get to this later, has anyone ever written an email and you need three things from your boss and they only reply with one of them? Yeah, right? And you're like, my boss is so dumb. Oh my gosh, you're like, I have to go to the back of the line now. It's like, I'm never gonna get this done. Like, my boss is so dumb. And the whole thing is, your boss isn't dumb. You just suck at writing emails. So we'll get to that later, but that's just a little bit of a flavor. So the exciting thing with this book is Chronicle Books, the publisher here, just picked it up and it's gonna have national and global distribution next fall. So that was very exciting. All right, the next book, we actually just launched this book on Tuesday, two days ago. I was in Iowa, of all places, launching it. Mount Vernon, Iowa. I'm huge in Iowa. <laughs> And so I went out there, and if you want an ego boost, go to Iowa to launch your book at a tiny college where you're basically like the Michael Jordan of books, and people wait like an hour to get a selfie with you and get your signature and everything like that. It was amazing, so I was feeling great. And then earlier today, Michelle, who was just up earlier, hosted me at Facebook, and we did another event there, and we actually were live streaming with 10,000 followers. So it was very exciting to get this book out in the world. So this book, the topic is obvious, how to be a boss. But the thing about being a boss is, it's really, really hard, right? Do I get an amen out there? It, it's really, really hard. You're asked to be a teacher, you're asked to be a coach, you're asked to be a psychologist, a cheerleader, you're a shoulder to cry on, you're a rock to push against, and oh, by the way, you're also supposed to be a business person. I mean, that's asking a lot of you. And when I was thinking about going out on tour and this whole idea of like, why did I write this book about how to be a boss? I was thinking about, I had to spend six years of my life learning how to conjugate verbs into French, future tense, past tense, everything like that. And all I can do now is order a yellow pencil when I go to the restaurant. It was like all these things that I've taught, been taught all these things that schools and everyone's tried to ingrain in you, but where's all the practical advice? You know, think about when you're a boss, when you become a boss, you've been in charge of yourself your whole life, and then all of a sudden one day they say, here's two human beings. Why don't you just experiment on them and try and figure this thing out? And it's totally unfair. Nobody says to you, don't do this, do that, and no matter what, no matter what, don't say that. There's no guide for that. There's no one telling you what to do. Your boss is too busy, they give you some people, and then you go screw it up time and time again, and eventually you try and do some things right, but it never goes right. It's really, really hard. And in fact, it can be overwhelming. And so when I put out this book, when I wrote this book, I divided the idea of being a boss into two parts, people and process. Now, the people part is really, really hard, because if there's another human being involved, things are gonna go wrong. And in that part of the book, we talk about nine ways to make your team hate you, 10 ways to make your team love you, how to lead, how to motivate, how to get people promoted. Let's see, what else? How to fire people, we talk about that. And then in the process side of the book, this is the easy part. These are the things you should never get wrong, ever and I break it down into 10 things you need to do every single day as a boss, including Fridays. 
And then I point out there's three things. There's only three things you need to do every week to be a good boss. And in fact, there's only two things you need to do every month. There's only one thing you need to do every quarter. And there's nothing you should do on a yearly basis. Because that is a meaningless portion of time because you can't measure, measure yourself against it. So that's kind of the layout of the book, and that gives you this big grand scheme of things. But let's get into the heart of things. I want to talk about code words. And this is kind of warm you up and, and bring you inside. This is like inside baseball. What I mean by code words are, you think I'm saying this, but I'm actually saying that. All right? This happens all the time in the workplace. And the scary thing is a lot of people don't realize it. They go their entire career not realizing that what people say to them at the office may not in fact be what they mean. So let me give you an example of this. How's it going? Has anyone ever heard that in the office? How's it going? Right? And people hear this and they're just like, wow, my boss is so nice. He's always asking me how it's going. Now let me ask everyone something else before we get into this. How many people feel like they don't get credit for all the work they do? You all get credit for all the work you do? You're the most amazing people in the world. I know that's not true. I saw one honest hand right there. Okay, there comes more. Everyone's like, okay, it's okay to say that. Trust me, I've been working in corporate America 17 years. I know this. This is the number one thing everyone's I, I'm working so hard. I'm doing great work. I'm just not getting credit. My boss doesn't recognize it. And by the way, like... John doesn't even do as good a work as me, but like he's getting promoted. This is totally unfair. It's like all these things are running through your mind at all times. And it's all like, I don't get credit for the work I do. Well, this is going to change your life. Because all those times your boss was coming by and saying, how's it going? And you're thinking, wow, my boss is so nice. Gosh, they just really care about me. Always checking in on me, all these things. What your boss is actually saying when they say, how's it going? They're saying, I don't trust you. So every time someone has said to you, how's it going? What they're actually saying is, I don't trust you. And I want this to be a little bell that goes off in your head. The next time when you go, when you go to work tomorrow and someone swings by and just goes, hey, how's it going? I want you to think what they're actually saying to me, Justin just told me this, is they don't trust me. Now let me explain what this means, okay? Here's what happens, here's what most people think happens on a project. Your boss asks you to do something, you go away and do it, and then you turn in the project. Boom, that was easy, I did my job, it was a great project, I even turned it in on time. That's super. Well, let me tell you what actually happens on a project. Your boss asks you to do something, you go away and work on it, then your boss swings by your desk and is like, hey, how's it going? And you're like, great, great, everything's great, just working, you know, thanks for saying hi, that's great, I'm just gonna keep working over here. And then you keep working, and then maybe a day goes by, or maybe it's the same day in the afternoon, and your boss comes by and just says, hey, how's it going? And you're like, gosh, I have the nicest boss. They're always wondering how I'm doing, it's fantastic. And then you turn in the project. And you very well may have done all of the work. The work may have been absolutely perfect. You turned it in on time, all of that. But guess what? You're not getting credit for doing that work because the boss's experience is that the work never would have gotten done if they hadn't checked up on you. You see that? You've never realized that. You're like, oh my gosh, this is so scary. But the point is, you've got to consider the boss's experience. And so the boss is walking down the hall this way going, wow, I'm such a good boss because I managed that project and made sure it got done on time. And then you're sitting at your desk and you're going, why don't I get credit for any of the work I've done? It's because the boss thinks it wouldn't have got done without them. They're taking credit for your work. And the warning sign is when they're checking in on you and saying, how's it going? They're saying, I don't trust you. I don't think this is going to get done. That's the point. So here's how to fix it. When your boss gives you a project, you go back to your desk, and you send them an email the same day, and you say, hey, boss, thanks for the project. Really excited about it. Here's the game plan for getting it done. I'm going to turn it in on Friday, but I'll send you an update on Wednesday, and if I can, I'll send you the rough draft Thursday night. Thanks. 
Super simple, don't say a lot, keep it very short. So now, before I've done any work on the project, no one in this room has any idea whether that's gonna go well or not, I've already gotten credit for the project once. Because I've showed my boss, I am organized. I have a plan, you can trust me. I've already gotten credit for the project once, I've done no work. That's a pretty good deal. Now, when it gets to Wednesday, as you promised, take that original email, forward it to your boss and say, hey boss, I'm right on schedule, things have been going great, Julie and I are working hard on this, you know, we're on track, you know, that's it. Just wanna give you an update. Boom, I just got credit for the project two times and I've only done a little bit of work. Now the boss's experience is, wow, Justin is organized. Justin's getting things done. I feel like I can trust Justin. He has no idea, she has no idea whether I'm doing a good job or a bad job on this project, but already two times, they're like, I like working with Justin. So then you get to Thursday, and I always say by 5 p.m. Thursday, you've got to send them the rough draft. You just have to deliver things early if you wanna get ahead in the world. That's just a fact of life. But I turn it in on Thursday and say, hey boss, here's the project, it's 85% done or it's 100% done, just wanted to give you a pre-read, let you know I'm ready for tomorrow. So now I get credit for it three times. Boom, I haven't even turned in the project and three times I'm getting credit. And then okay, I turn the project tomorrow on Friday. Four times I got credit for a project versus you are sitting there getting zero credits for doing a project or one because you're living and dying on the idea of I'm gonna turn in the perfect project. And it's gonna be so impressive because I never asked my boss a single question and it was absolutely perfect. That never happens. So here's the thing, get credit for the project four times. Think about how that adds up over a lifetime or even a month or even a week of your career. If every project you're getting credit four times while everyone else in your office is living and dying with one credit, it's easy to imagine how you can get ahead in the world and you can ensure that you're gonna get credit. So every time your boss comes by your desk and says, how's it going? What I want you to think is, ooh, my boss is nervous. I've missed a chance to give them an update. And so now you've learned and next time you'll know to give them that update early, all right? So that's one of the code words that I like to bring to everyone's attention and I hope the rest of your lives you can never hear someone say that without thinking, I don't, tr they just said I don't trust you. All right, the next code word is, there's a lot going on. Do people say that in your offices? It's a pretty common refrain, right? What we're talking about here with, there's a lot going on, is we're talking about priorities. And so what happens is, you know, I do this too, you walk up to your boss and you just go, wow, there's a lot going on. And then your boss goes, yeah, yeah, totally, totally, there's a lot going on, it's crazy right now, I know, cool, cool. And you're like, okay, well that didn't really help, but uh, that's fine. And here's the thing, if you're a boss and someone on your team walks up to you and says, there's a lot going on, the point isn't to agree with them, the point is to understand that what they're actually saying is, my boss sucks at their job, right? That's what they're saying. They're literally saying to you, I, like, I'm a boss. So when someone comes up and says, there's a lot going on, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, what an insult. You just said my boss sucks at their job, because the truth is your boss does suck at their job. If there's so much going on that they can't set priorities, they're sucking at their job. So this is all about priorities. And the thing about priorities are, Everyone understands that priorities are important. Everyone's like, we have to set priorities. Focus on the priorities. And does this happen? You go in, you say there's a lot going on, you sit down with your boss, you have eight things that you say out loud to them, and then you walk out of that room, and you still have eight things to do, but they're just in a different order, or they're organized on a pad, and you're like, oh, all right, we set the priorities. It's like, well, if you still have eight things to do, you didn't set priorities, you didn't solve anything. And the truth is it's hard to set priorities. It's hard to set priorities because people are scared to say no to something. There might be projects that are assigned from another vice president and you don't wanna offend them. Or to actually have to admit that one thing is more important than another 
is really scary for people. They don't want that like getting back to them. And so people just find a way to shuffle the papers around. People say there's a lot going on, and then people say, yeah, totally, let's just try and do it. But here's the counterintuitive way that I would recommend, whether you're a boss or, or an employee or whatever it is, if there's a lot going on and you want to set priorities, focus on all the dumb stuff. I could never get everyone in this room to agree what is the biggest priority, what's the second priority, what's the third priority. One through eight, we're all going to have a different ranking. But what I'm here to tell you is focus on number nine through number 22 and get rid of all of those. Because the truth is, you got to just get rid of all the things that don't matter. And all of us are doing things that don't matter. There's forms that we're filling out that are legacies from old bosses. There's meetings that we're going to that take 30 minutes that could be 10 minutes or could be an email. And the point is, you need to get rid of all of that, because if I get rid of number nine through number 22, all of a sudden there's more room to breathe for number one through eight. And now you've got more room for these priorities that everyone's gonna say, we can never get rid of these. And so the point is, focus on the dumb stuff. Now if you're a boss, you don't do this in the moment of crisis. You can't do this at the moment where everyone's like, there's a lot going on, the building's about to burn down, and you're like, you know what guys, let's focus on the things that aren't important. Important. Instead, you want to think of it as spring cleaning. Twice a year, I do this every company that I go to, every division I go to, one of the first things I do is I sit down with everyone and say, what are the things that annoy you? What are the things that are wasting your time? What are the things that are not making a difference to the bottom line? And you would be shocked what a simple question like that will elicit. People aren't going to be like, oh, give me some time to think about it. Oh, I'm not sure. I can't think of anything. You will be buried in ideas of things that people think that they should get rid of. And your job is not to have the answer in that moment. Your job is to take that entire list of things that people are like, this is wasting my time. This is frustrating me. This could be done better. Why don't we do it this way? Take that entire list and then methodically go through and figure out which ones you can problem solve. It's a chance for you to be a hero as a boss. And as a boss, you're always looking for a moment to feel good about yourself and look good in front of other people. Because everyone forgets that bosses are human too. We're insecure, we're nervous, all these different things. But if someone tells you, I hate doing this, and you can solve that problem, you've got a fan for life. They'll go run into a wall for you because they're telling you this is what I want you to do and then you do it for them, you're like a superhero. So my idea here is when you hear people saying there's a lot going on, it's got a cue for you, wait a minute, I'm not setting priorities, I'm not thinking ahead, what can I get rid of so my team has more time to work, all right? So that's just another code word I wanna go through. But let's move on. How to motivate people. Sometimes work is boring. Yeah, I said it. <laughs> Filling out forms, going to the same meeting, in the same room, with the same people, in day after day, week after week, month after month, sometimes it gets boring. And people get complacent, they stop learning, and ultimately they lose motivation. But your job as a boss is to make sure this never happens. You have to be diligent about it. Because if even one person on your team loses motivation, it can spread through the entire team and ruin everything. Here you are trying to get the team to work on a project and one person on the team is like, why do we even bother? It's not even gonna change anything. The vice president's not gonna agree to it. And then the other three people on the team that were willing to do the work with you are like, Oh yeah, I think he's right. I don't care either. And now motivation is lack, it's, it's, it's lacking in everyone. So one bad apple can really spoil the bunch here. So you've got to be paying attention to motivation or lack of motivation. Now when it comes to motivating people, there's different ways to do it. You can be a cheerleader, you can give people compliments, you can challenge people, some people rep respond to that. You can throw a party. You can also promote someone. That's like a, uh, an expensive way to motivate someone, but usually that does work for at least a little while. But I wanted to offer two counterintuitive 
ways to motivate people. Give people more work. That doesn't always come to mind when you say I want to motivate someone. And then the other one is the Jedi mind trick. Now, I don't have a lot of time in this talk, so I'm just going to talk about one of these. And I'm guessing we'd rather hear about the Jedi mind trick. We've got the movie coming up, you know, all of those things. Any Star Wars fans in the audience? I mean, it's a designers and geeks event. We have no Star Wars fans? OK. Let's talk about the Jedi mind trick. This was the single most motivating moment of my entire life when this happened to me. And, and I want to give you a little background. What normally happens on a project? You do some work, then you hand it to your boss, they check it, they give you some corrections, you go back, you fix it, and then you turn it into the boss's boss, right? That's kind of like the way it works. It's like, okay, I did the work, now will you check this work? And they're like, okay, change this. And then you go to the big boss, and then you do it like that, right? And what happens is over time, you start to realize, okay, I always have a safety net. I've got my boss there checking the work, and they're gonna make sure I never look bad. And then you start to realize, you know what? My boss always wants to change things, so now I'm just gonna do like 75% effort, because the boss is gonna change it anyway, so why should I try and make it really good? So I'll just hand it off to the boss, let them make their changes, then I'll make those changes that they tell me to, and then we'll go present it together. That's pretty much how 95% of the working world works. But here's what happened to me one day. I had a new boss, his name was Arthur Lewis, I'll never forget this. It was his second day on the job. We were going to present to the president of Old Navy. And I said, hey Arthur, I've got the document ready for the presentation tomorrow. I'm just gonna drop it off here, you can check it and give me any notes later. And he just looked up, to, look at, looked up at me and he just said, oh, I don't need to see it, I'm sure you're gonna be great. And I was like, what? And he's like, no, I don't need to see it. I'm sure you're going to be great. I know you're going to do a good job. I was like, I got chills. I like started sweating. I was like, oh my gosh, what? And of course, what happened? I picked up the paper. I went back to my desk. And I worked so hard for the next two hours to make that presentation so perfect. Because all of a sudden, it was my ass on the line. I didn't have a safety net. All of a sudden, someone had said to me, I trust you. Someone had chosen to show empowerment to me, and it was the most motivating moment of my life. Because your whole life, everyone's built to tell you what you could do better, what you could do, you know, what you need to do next. And my dad's telling me when you walk downhill, make sure you bend your knees and lean backwards. And I'm like, I'm like, Dad, I'm 32 years old. Let me walk however I want. But the truth is, with a single act of saying, I trust you, I'm sure you do a great job. He motivated me so much. And for the next two years, I was like the most amazing soldier for him. And I did everything and I loved doing it because now it was my work and I took pride in it. And it was an incredible, incredible experience. So that's that Jedi mind trick because just by saying, I think you'll do, I, I know you're gonna do a good job. They're actually gonna do a good job. So that's something to use. Now, the only thing I should just mention while I'm moving on to the next slide is the Jedi mind trick doesn't work with everybody. In fact, the degree of difficulty, if you do this with the wrong person, it is going to be a total failure. <laughs> so some people in the audience I know are listening to this and they're like, oh, I love the Jedi mind trick. I just basically do no work and tell everyone they're gonna do a good job and then it's all taken care of. <laughs> that's not exactly how it works. The Jedi mind trick works well with the people who are already doing a good job or are hard workers or the people that kind of top 10%, maybe we can get to 15%, you could stretch it to 20%. But be really careful, because if you start using Jedi mind trick with the people that aren't ready for it, it's all gonna fall apart. And I saw this firsthand at Old Navy because Arthur had this amazing team of three people, I'll include myself in it, and he just was throwing the Jedi mind tricks all over, and it was just like, and it was working, and the business was amazing, everyone's like, Arthur's the best boss, I've never had anyone like him, this is amazing, and so then they promoted Arthur, and they moved him to a different division that had a bunch of not good kind of director level reporting to him, and he kept throwing out these Jedi mind trick cards, and he was like doing all this thing, the whole business collapsed on itself. I think they lost a billion dollars in one year. So 
Jedi mind trick doesn't always work. But when it works, when applied correctly, it's incredibly motivating. So choose wisely, you will. And that's something to learn from, okay? So let's just move on. This is gonna be the last topic before we get to the Q&A, so I promise I'll move quickly. How to give feedback. This is always a scary topic for people. And I've got written up here, feedback is just an eight letter word for talking to another human being. Because we get so wrapped up in feedback and it gets so scary. But the truth is it's just about a human to human interaction. And so in the book I've got 10 pointers for here's what you do and don't about feedback. And then I've got here's the five steps to a perfect feedback meeting. And then I've got five conversation starters. So there's a lot in the book around this topic because I think it's one that a lot of people struggle with. But here's what I want to talk about with feedback. Act fast and look in the mirror. Now when I talk about act fast, and I'm just going to go through this really quickly so we can get to the Q&A. When I'm talking about act fast, I'm talking about positive feedback. Most people don't realize positive feedback has an expiration date. If you don't give the positive feedback by 5 p.m. the same day, it loses all of its nutrients, all of its power, and it's almost worthless. And so I hear people all the time, you know, they're like, oh, well, I didn't want to fill up their email inbox, so I didn't send them like a good job email, or you know what, they're all the way across the room and they're talking to someone and I don't want to interrupt them, so I'm not going to say anything. And the truth is, that is the only ma moment that matters. Because we were talking about this earlier today. Imagine Michelle just did a presentation this morning. She's been working on that for the last two days, three days, it doesn't matter. She gives the presentation, she's all amped up, she's got all this adrenaline in her because she's on the line, she's presenting this, and then she walks out and no one says anything. Imagine of all the emotions running through her body at that moment. She's put herself out there, she's tried hard, it's all, she's ready to be defensive, to do all these things, and then she walks out and no one says anything. How defeating is that, right? And then maybe two days later, I walk up to Michelle and I just go, hey, Michelle, good job on that presentation. And she's like, what presentation? And I'm like, you know the one two days ago, like on Tuesday in that conference room that looks like all the other conference rooms? She's like, oh, I don't know, I've, I've done three projects since then. And so it doesn't mean anything. I mean, look, it, it's a good job for trying, but you lose all of the nourishment. Now think of the alternative. Michelle did all this work for a project. She's really nervous. How did it go? I'm not sure. If I just am able to reach out to her and just say, hey, good job in there. That totally changes her day. And then she goes on to four other projects with a little spring in her step saying, hey, I like working hard for Justin. He acknowledges the work I put in. Hey, that feels pretty good. So this next project that he tells me to do, or the next time he tells me I've got to redo everything I did because he gave me bad direction, <laughs> I don't mind because you know what? Sometimes he says nice things. So the point is, it expires. And there's no good excuse for not giving positive feedback. No matter how small it is, say it. I've never heard of anyone getting positive feedback and being like, Dude, you're filling up my inbox. Ugh, this is so annoying. Or, hey, can't you see I was in the middle of a conversation? Why don't you hold your compliment? <laughs> you know, no one says that. Everyone is human. Everyone wants just a kind word. Everyone wants their existence to be acknowledged. Especially if you're a boss and you're moving up in the organization, it's something you don't realize how much everyone else is looking at you just wondering what is going on in that person's head. I would die to be acknowledged by that person. And so if you have a chance to say something nice, say it. Now, I didn't even mean to get into this. I always wanted to talk about look in the mirror because this one's always interesting to me. We're talking about feedback. And some people actually like giving feedback. Earlier in my career, I liked giving feedback because I thought, I'm going to help everyone be just like me. And every time someone messed up or every time someone did something not as well as I thought they could, I rushed into the void and I said, hey, that was a pretty good job in there, but I think you could do these three things better. And it was like, I thought I was being a good boss. I literally had no ill intent, but man, I was the world's worst boss. And so my point here and look in the mirror is when you're thinking about feedback, 
before you go tell someone how much they suck, look in the mirror and ask yourself this simple question. Is there anything I could have done to help them be better at that task? Is there anything I could have done to help them be better at their job? Did I do everything that I possibly could? Did I do everything I possibly could to set them up for success? Now, of course, the answer to this question is 100% of the time, there's always something more you could have done. And so the point here is take responsibility. Because the thing is, nobody wants to suck at their job. There's no one out there going in every day going, I can't wait to undermine these people, and it's so fun just being the worst at this. <laughs> nobody is thinking that. And so as a boss, you've got to put yourself in their shoes and, and ask yourself, did I take the time to actually teach them how to fill out the form, or did I just tell them to fill out the form? Now, did I really teach them how the process works and how I want it to look, or did I just complain that it wasn't how it was in my head? And we all know the answer to those questions. And so the point is, look in the mirror. And here's the thing. It doesn't mean you can't talk to the person, but it's going to totally change the dynamic. Because when you go to sit with someone, you're going to say, hey, listen, I realized that I threw this form at you, and I didn't even sit down and walk you through how we should make it look. And that was my mistake. I'm really sorry for that. So here's what I want to make sure we do in the future. All, look at that conversation. I can still be saying, hey, that form wasn't filled out correctly, but I've humbled myself first. I've taken some responsibility first. And if you take responsibility first, aren't you more likely to get the other person to acknowledge their own shortcomings? Because all of a sudden, it's not about, hey, I'm really smart. You seem kind of dumb. So let me tell you how to get smarter. <laughs> That's how most feedback is received. But if you say, you know what? I realized there's some things I could have done differently. Here's what I noticed. What did you notice? Or here's what I noticed. Here's how let's do it next time. All of a sudden, you're on the same team with the same goal trying to make something better. So humbling yourself, admitting something that you could do better is going to ingratiate yourself for the feedback to land on a soft, fluffy pillow. And behaviors are going to change because you're modeling the fact that you don't think you're Mr. Perfect. So this looking in the mirror, when you get all riled up to give someone feedback, tell them everything they've done wrong, I encourage you to figure out what could you have done differently. Now, if you're sitting in the chair and you're like, you know what, I can never think of anything I would do differently, you have bigger problems than you ever imagined. And I say that as someone who definitely was sitting in one of those chairs seven years ago being like, yeah, but this guy doesn't know how good I am at my job. So I promise you there's always something you can do better. Start there and then get into the conversation.